good morning in Stockholm, or good afternoon, I should say. Good afternoon. We don't know if they're talking to us. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do we want to do today? First of all, we want to entertain questions. So, are there questions? That's right. Homework number six is due today. Uh huh. <coughs> yes. Please, uh, please turn in your homework at your early convenience. Um, <coughs> that would be a good thing to do. Yep. <coughs> but are there other questions? Hearing none in Durham, are there any questions in Stockholm? No, we don't have any questions. Okay, that's fantastic. So what are we going to do today? Today is the 27th. I think I'm going to go back to the 27th. Okay, today is the 27th. One thing we're not going to discuss is basketball. Uh -huh. right? Never going to, not until the team writes itself. Okay. Uh, okay. So we want having completed successfully, we hope, homework number six. The next thing to do is homework number seven, right? A logical progression. So we want to discuss homework number seven. We'll do that first. <coughs> and then we'll continue our discussion of just response. Homework number seven was all about clutter, right? And then we're going to continue our discussion of dust response. Now, to discuss homework number seven, we need to go all the way back to homework number seven. Recall uh, the notes, the lecture notes. Or 2018, 2020. That was a while ago, right? But we were slowed down because we decided to explore reversal more in depth and some other things. But that's okay. That's part of the learning process. Sometimes you have to go back, detour, come back again. So I'm not going to rewrite my notes from 2018, 2020. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to refer you to those, which I know you have close to your heart. Okay? So let's go back and look at uh, at those notes. And we're, in particular, we're looking at uh, pages four to seven, for those of you keeping score. So we're now back on those notes. So let me find them. There they are. Um, so let me remind you of what we are doing and want to do with respect to wing flood. Uh, well, first of all, let me draw a picture. Let me draw this picture. This, this, we're doing, this, we're using the same model that we, same physical model that we use for reversal, right? So we have this wing, and we're going to assume it's nice and rectangular with a, an elastic axis. And the elastic axis bends as it does in dust response, primarily. It also twists as it does in reversal and divergence. But in flutter, we have it all. We have bending and twisting. In fact, in classical flutter, which is probably at least half, if not three quarters of all the flutter cases, one of counters in practice, it's really the coupling between bending and flutter, bending and twisting that leads to flutter. So we're looking at the classical case. Um, yes. I was wondering when the elastic acts and then distance from the elastic acts is in the field, so easy to the field. What distance from where? You yeah, say the I distance from last time is where? Yeah, exactly. Hmm? But my question is, where do we calculate the elastic acts? That's you. You talk about how do I choose my coordinate system and how yeah. do I locate the elastic acts? Uh, <laughs> there are two traditional choices. 
you can choose any place you want, right? But if you want to uh, conform to what most people do, you'd either choose the mid chord or the leading edge. Okay. And some authors do one, and some authors do another. Right. What's really important, as it turns out, for flutter and most other elastic responses, is the distance from the elastic axis to the center of mass axis, or the distance from the elastic axis to the aerodynamic center axis. Those are the two critical distances. And it's not so much absolutely where they are, it's all, it's all about their relative position. But in terms of the coordinate system you use to say the axis is here rather than there, most people either choose a, uh, a, an axis system from the lean edge or the mid -core. Okay. Okay. So do you need to get the distance between the aerodynamic center and the last axis? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, one, one thing to remember, so when you're at a cocktail party and talking to somebody, from going, who's been doing this for 30 years, says, oh yes, well I know the last thing I can put the bees around this chord, and of course they're there. Sorry, as everyone knows, that low speed flow is at the quarter point. But if he's a super side person, he says, of course I know that the paradigm center moves back to the mid chord, super side flow, and it's somewhere in between quarter chord and mid chord in the front side region, and no one quite knows where it is because the aerodynamic center isn't that good. You may not want to tell them that. So. How many drinks you have? And they have. Okay, does that help? Yeah. Okay. All right, so that's what we're looking at. And and now, uh, let's go back to these notes from from uh, this date, February 18th. So, page four, well, that's both of them simple things. We can model it as. Um, Yeah. Yeah. We can model it as uh, something that has kinetic energy. So this is the mass per unit span. This is the moment of inertia about the elastic axis per unit span. And this is the so-called mass offset. And I'll define that a little more specifically in a moment. Uh, this is the potential energy. Part of it is due to twisting, the torsional system GJ. Part of it is due to bending of the elastic axis, the bending surface TI. And the virtual work is a combination of moment and lift. It's moment times the virtual change in twist, and the lift times the virtual change in the displacement, the translation of the elastic axis. And there's a minus sign because I've repeated this endlessly. It doesn't have to be a minus sign, but the usual sign convention is a minus sign because the lift is up. And the reflection down. Those, that's the sign. It's the sign convention of L and H in the back there in opposite directions. So these are the minus. Then we're going to use this simple paradigm theory because we don't know a better one yet. Those of you who take the second half of the course you know, discover there, there are many more elaborate representations of this, but this is what we're using from home. And it's not too bad under some circumstances. It usually gives you a qualitative with correct answer. Maybe not quality, quality. And then the moment is the moment about the aerodynamic center, which by definition is independent of alpha, and therefore flutter analysis we can ignore it. Because flutter is only going to depend on forces that relate to H and alpha. In the linear model, the presence or absence of a gust doesn't affect the flutter position, the flutter dynamic pressure. In a nonlinear model, it might, but not hopefully too much. In a linear model, you can cleanly separate gust response as one kind of analysis and flutter as a different kind of analysis. And then, from Hamilton's principle, knowing all this, you can drive these equations of motion. And part of homework in seven is to do that. Because you don't want to take my word for it. Right? I might have dropped a minus sign or factor of pi or something. And so what I say is using one, two, and three and Hamilton's principle, derive equations. And you can do that. Not only will you get these equations, but you'll get as a bonus and no extra charge what other information that some people find important. From Hamza's question, what do you get besides the, in addition to the equations of motion? What else do you get? Boundary conditions, absolutely. And that might be important. Okay? So you can derive the boundary conditions too. In fact, you, you won't necessarily do that. And deriving these equations of motion. 
Okay. So moving right along. Yeah. Moving right along. Uh, and I have a little discussion. I probably have a little discussion about our conditions. This isn't the whole story. This is part of the story. So this gives you a hint of how the boundary conditions will emerge. Okay. Then how do I do a floor analysis? I take alpha and H, which depend on Y and time, right? They depend on the location, length, and span in this model and time. And I assume that the time dependence has this form because within the framework of linear theory, if I want to do a stability analysis and, and find out whether the system is stable or not, whether if I disturb it, the oscillation, there's an oscillation that damps out or an oscillation that grows. That's why I want to know. Well, this is the most general form of the time dependence I need to examine. And again, within the framework of linear theory, all other time dependences can be used to consider a, a linear combination of exponential forms. So I'm going to find all the possible exponential forms. And they don't look down to be a complex number. And the real part tells me whether the, uh, the oscillation grows or decays. And the imaginary part tells me the frequency of the oscillation. And the frequency is interesting to know. Why? Because if I'm going to do a flight test or wind tunnel test, I, know, I will need to know on what frequency range should I be looking <laughs> to see if flutter is about to emerge. Also, if I do a wind tunnel test and a flight test, and I usually measure it in the flutter speed or the flutter dynamic pressure, and also the frequency, if I get a really good agreement between the theory and experiment on flutter speed and a lousy agreement on frequency, I know I just got lucky in terms of, in terms of flutter speed. Because if I'm not if I'm not correlating between theory and experiment on the frequency as well as the frequency, I know my model is not really doing the job. Okay, and then I have to assume some form of y. Uh, it depends on y of alpha and h, and I'm I'm allowing to assume that these simple forms. Alpha is linear and y over l. Remember, in the in inverse and so forth, we assume that the sine pi over two y over l. Well, a linear variation isn't that, but it's not too bad. <laughs> and I, I'm not going to use these forms because of the easier how to break them. Uh, in, a, in a real analysis, we probably use the sine functions here, and we use several of them. And we use some bending mode functions here, but if you've taken a course in vibrations from Dr. Kilo, and you know what the attributes of the bending beam are, that's what you would use, really. But for this homework problem, because I'm such a nice person, I'm allowing you to use these simple forms. Okay, okay. as mentioned, beta has a real part and an imaginary part. You're going to tell me. Uh, in this particular case, because we're using such a simple aerodynamic theory, okay, it will turn out that there will the form of the solutions that determine beta will be actually a quadratic in beta squared, and a quadratic in beta squared is a quartic or a quartic in polynomial in beta, right? Uh, and then here's what here's what the answer is going to look like. Uh, for small values of dynamic pressure, the betas will be purely imaginary, representing frequencies of oscillation. When Q is zero, those are the natural frequencies of the system. So you're going to compute the natural frequencies of this bending, twisted system when you set Q to zero. <coughs> and when Q increases, these frequencies are going to change. They actually come together. They'll merge at this point, which turns out to be the flutter point. And then they remain the same thereafter. For this particular system, uh, because of the nature of the, of the mathematics, the betas will, will be complex conjugates. That is, for every positive value of the imaginary part of beta, there will be a corresponding negative value. Physically, they represent the same frequency. It's just a matter of, of phase shift. Okay. The real parts will be identically zero up to this point where the frequencies come together. Okay. And then they'll split. This is called a hot bifurcation by mathematicians and some engineers. Hop was a mathematician. And he studied this kind of behavior. Okay, a lot of other people have too, but he's usually given credit for 
for it in terms of the naming opportunities. <coughs> okay, so that's it. Um, now, one other thing I'll tell you before we get to the last page. Uh, in this model, this is alpha, right? I could make life more challenging for me, and may do that later on, but not for this only. I could, in addition, write a term which we included in the test response analysis, right? We are omitting here. I could include a term that was like H dot over U. If I did that, that will represent introducing damping into the system. You see, without this term, there's no damping in the system. There's no damping in kinetic energy. There's none in potential energy. And there's none in the aerodynamic model without that term. Okay. So even without damping, though, I can get flutter of the classical sort. With this term, I would introduce damping in the system. How would that change matters? I'll tell you back. What that would do is, uh, first of all, zero Q, I wouldn't have any damping because, ah, this term gets multiplied by Q, right? So Q to zero, there wouldn't be any damping. There's no aerodynamic damping when there's no flow. But as soon as there's a Q, there's some damping. So what that would do is, as soon as Q is not zero, there would be some, a non-zero value of the real part of beta. If the system is stable, all of those real parts of beta will be negative. Right? They'll all be negative. If one of them is positive, the system's unstable. Okay? And these frequencies would change a little bit, but not much. Then as you approach the flutter condition with the damping term in, here's the damping term in, these two frequencies would never come exactly together. They will come very close. And then when they, when beyond this point, they won't be exactly the same, but they'll be very close. Okay. And what will happen here is, usually, but not always, these, all these negative values that they are, one of them will continue on along this branch, actually two of them, and two of them will, will be close to this branch. What is sometimes disconcerting to some people is that even though that represents damping, if I put in that H dot term, sometimes that damping term can lower the value of dynamic pressure with the flutter curve. It is still a matter of debate, low these many years. Is that physical or is that just an artifact of our math model? And no one knows. And people tend to change over time. Okay. No one knows because this is uh, putting in that A star term is a is a, a, that's a, a imperfect approximation of the full aerodynamic theory. And I, as far as I know, when you use the full aerodynamic theory, this part just probably doesn't happen, which tends to suggest it's an artifact of the simplicity of the aerodynamic model. But what is even more disconcerting to people, some people, is if I put in structural damping, right? I can put structural damping in, right, as well as aerodynamic damping. The same thing happens with some models of structural damping. I put structural damping in, which a low Q does damp the system, but in, at a higher Q value, it actually lowers the function speed. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes. Well, where does structural damping come from? You, you, you've done structural dynamic analysis. Where, do, where does the structural damping come from? Where does it come from? It comes to the structure, but in the math modeling of the structural damping, where does it come from? What Dr. Field told you what it was. That's where it comes from. Now, he's a nice guy and has a lot of experience, but it's basically an empirical model, usually based on some experiments done without any flow, <laughs> and represents the result at best for that particular virtual system based on that particular experiment. And there's some classical forms which we'll discuss in the context of aerodynamic damping for just now. But yeah. There's not a fun for kinetic energy and potential energy, you know, if you believe in Hamilton and Newton and all that, it's pretty rigorous. And and there are no violations known to anyone that I know of. Within a broad range of physical phenomena. Structural damping is a total fluid. At least in parallel systems. We've got to be really careful. Uh, the good news is 
if the damping is small, it doesn't change things much. Whether, whether it increases the quantum speed or decreases the quantum speed, if the damping is small enough, it doesn't do, doesn't change it much either way. That's why people use factors of safety. Okay? Civil engineers use a factor of safety typically with a factor of four, as in 400%. In flutter, it's 15%. I tell you, truthfully, there's no one on this planet, including all the wonderful people here at Duke, who can take a clean sheet of paper and computer code and computer flutter speed and compare it to any physical experiment, including the ones that we build at Duke, and guarantee that we'll be within 50% every time. So, what happens in practice, I'm telling you a little bit about flutter analysis uh, and how you use it. If I do a computation and my flutter velocity is even within 50% of the anticipated flight condition, I don't stop with the computation. I then have a decision to make. Do I build a wind tunnel wall? <laughs> do I try to improve my computation model in some rational way or irrational? Or, or, or do I commit to a flight test with lots of money and lots of time? Okay. Now, <clears throat> if I actually do the flight test, then, and I fly at, fly the airplane 15% beyond its expected flight speed and it does the flutter, then I think I've guaranteed I've been, I'm within 50%, right? But I wouldn't rely on a pure computation. You wouldn't want to be the one flying in that aircraft, though. Well, test pilots get paid big bucks, that's why they get the paid big bucks. And, and when you do a, a, a flutter, when you do a flutter flight test, what do you do? First of all, you take the person up as high as you can make it. Why? Because the flutter velocity or Mach number is a function of altitude. It'll be higher at higher altitude. Also, if the plane breaks up, you've got more room to bail out, right? And, and that's why they do it. So you fly at a very high altitude, the highest the airplane will go and fly it as fast as you can. And establish that's okay. And then you progressively it over and over. But by doing that and by measuring the frequency and damping of the motion, you can sort of see am I close or not so close. Because in, in an analysis analysis, there's not just computing the flutter condition, you also compute the amount of damping there is in the system. Remember I, all my caveats about whether we can really compute damping very well? Or how the damping models that we put in are that good. But Nevertheless, in flight tests, you measure the frequency and the damping and try to try to see how close you think you are to a stability value. Okay. And if you're getting pretty close, uh, the plane comes back and the chief engineer in the flight test, I like have an intense discussion. <laughs> so, okay, anyway, okay, so that's that. Now, on the, on the homework, well, the more immediate challenge, homework. Uh, on page 7, from these notes from February 18th, I give you lots of information. And I give you information in initially in dimensional form because I thought it would be interesting for you to actually see how dimensions work out and how real water speeds look and all the rest of it. So I picked some dimensions which are typical of the model that we was put in our wind tunnel and have put in our wind tunnel and done a project. Uh, so the span is 20 inches. The core to span ratio is 0.2. The thickness is 0.05 inches. It's made out of aluminum. It's just a sheet of aluminum, right? Right thing, a sheet of aluminum. So it has a certain modulus. Uh, this is the this is the density of the aluminum. So I'll put a base of A over there. Uh, this is the expression for the um, bending stiffness term I, right? This is for the torsional stiffness term. J, it's one half, in this case, it's one twelfth the core times the thickness cube, and so forth. This is the mass per unit span, it's the density of the material, of the aluminum, times the thickness, uh, times the core. I'm going to let you compute the highest of alpha, which is the moment of inertia. So this is a mass parameter, this is a stiffness parameter, never to be confused with each other, right? Even though traditionally they both have the simple I. But I did put a step alpha on here to kind of give you a clue. S alpha is, is going to be shown to be the mass per unit span times the distance from the elastic axis to the area, excuse me, to the distance from the elastic axis to the center of mass. That's X sub C G. And if I had a nice uniform wind, the elastic axis would be in the center of mid-cord. 
and therefore this would be zero, right? Because the, the stair of mass would also be in the midpoint. But I want you to look at cases where somehow I've managed to toss up the, the uh, stair of mass a little bit from midpoint. And the way you do that physically would, would be to put a point mass on the wing. Now, I could ask you to include the point mass in your kinetic energy term. You could do that, if you thought about it. But I, I'm not asking you to do that. I, I'm just saying, pretend like we're going to do a variation. And a real engineer, as it were, we might do this. Which I think, I said, well, this is my nominal value, but I'm going to do some calculations about the nominal just to see how much sensitivity there is. Turns out this parameter is very sensitive. <laughs> I picked one which is very sensitive. Uh, we're going to have to hear, uh, left coefficient be 2 pi, which is typical of low speed flows. We're going to assume solutions of this form, where alpha bar and h bar depend on y, right? So we're going to, we're going to find the betas from an eigenvalue analysis and a little bit of computer, uh, programming. We're going to plot that versus q. Uh, the real part will give you, uh, the damping, the matching property of the frequency. And then finally, I want you to return to dimensionless forms, because this is uh, interesting intellectually, and it's also a sanity check to make sure you've got a reasonable answer. And now I've asked you to, to construct this two hole number of the reduced frequency. It's the frequency of flutter, or it's any other frequency, but in particular, it's in the frequency of flutter, times the core divided by the flow point. If that number turns out to be a million, you made a major mistake. If that number turns out to be 10 to the minus 3, you made a major mistake. If that number is anything other than somewhere between 0.1 and 1, you should start questioning here. You could do a so-called scale analysis, which we're going to cover in this case. Uh, but it's a powerful tool. You can non-dimensionalize all the equations, go through it, and convince yourself without any computation whatsoever. I think so. The K should be a order of 1. Order one means structure speaking it should be somewhere between point one and ten. But usually it's within the fact that it's two to three to one. Okay. Also, remember this parameter? This is a non dimensional Q parameter, right? We can think about non dimensional Q. And for divergence, this parameter turned out to be pi over for a uniform way, it turned out to be pi over two squared. Pi over two squared is about two. You can work it out. Okay? And again, you can use scale analysis to prove that this thing should be a order of one. Two is close enough to one for order analysis, right? So again, when you compute this parameter for your flutter case, if it turns out to be a million, you know, you drop something somewhere. This should be a order of one. Might be three, might be a third, maybe two. It shouldn't be wildly different from one. So having these ideas in mind, it gives you a nice sanity check when you get some result of the computer. If you're going, the computer code is massive. Uh, hardly anyone knows what's in it. Great detail. People run the code, right? I mean, it was developed three, 30 years ago and then modified six different times by six different people. And still, the standard code that you run if you're at Bowen, right? And you probably have nothing to do with writing that code. But you'd like to know whether the answer is something. And by looking at non dimensional parameters, that's one way to do a sandwich. Okay. That's all I want to say about homework number seven, except if there are questions. So we'll look at Durham, North Carolina, and then Stockholm. So any questions about homework number seven? <laughs> what are we going to do? Homework seven and eight. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Ah, thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Remember, uh, on page seven, these are notes from 2000, oh, excuse me, from October 18th. I marked out March 3rd. And as generously put in March. Uh, I've discovered that my due dates are somewhat tentative. They're not canceled on the street. But do your best. See if you can get it done by next Thursday. Stop home. Do you have any questions? No, no questions. All right. That either means you're totally buffaloed or you understand it perfectly. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, it real, probably really means you haven't, haven't started working on it yet. You'll have questions after you start working on it. Is that right? Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, okay. Now, moving right along. 
moving right along, let's now continue our discussion of death, death analysis. Okay. And after that, uh, I'm going to refer back to our notes from the last class. Refer back to notes of 225-2020. I love there's so many twos. We didn't have a class on 222. Oh, we missed that day. That would have been a perfect day. Number one. For some of well, no, you're not going to live to 2222 either, are you? <laughs> okay. So now let's go back to the uh, two votes earlier. So this is, these are the notes from 225 2020. And let me remind you of what I covered fairly quickly the other day by way of uh, just response. So this is page five from the notes of that day. And again, we're going to look at our uniform wing because that's sort of our, our standard model of link angel. By the way, we are going to consider wings that are not, not, not too simple. But I was, I'm introducing the ideas of flutter and gust response for this still a simple configuration. Because qualitatively, that often is a, a pretty good answer. But later on, we'll think about what happens if the shape will handle something else. And, and even if the, the deformation of the plate is separation will handle more plate-like rather than beam torsion-like, right? which high-speed wings often are. Okay. So again, we're going to start with kinetic energy. And we want to start with kinetic energy. But now we're only going to allow for bending. We're not going to consider torsion because for test response, that's a pretty good approximation. Again, you might put torsion in in your gust analysis. Depends on the configuration, whatever. But this is a good way to start. So here's kinetic energy. Here's potential energy. Here's the virtual work that's down just due to the lift and the bending, right? And now our lift is going to have both H dot and WG. Why am I including H dot? Well, if I include H dot, I'm dead in the water. It's worth That's an answer. Because typically I'm going to have a random gust, or even if I have a sinusoidal gust, that sinusoidal gust frequency might be close to the resonant frequency of the structure. And if it's close to the resonant frequency of the structure, and I don't have any damping in the model, my damping predicts an infinite response at resonance. That's not a useful answer. Okay? So, the damping in the system is really important for gust analysis. For classical bending torsion flutter, the damping may give me fascinating and perhaps even questionable results. But they don't differ so much from the result without damping that it's a major problem, usually. But in, in gust response, damping is a huge part of the story. It's also probably the weak link <laughs> because it's the thing I know least well. The only good news is most of the damping tends to come from the aerodynamics. And there is a, a fairly rigorous and believable theory. And it could be the Niagara's growth equation, not usually used in dust analysis, but it could be, right? It could be the Euler equation. It could be classical potential flow theory, which we will discuss on in the course. Or it could even be this, both of these simple ones, right? But the point is I need to put damping in the system, otherwise I don't get a useful answer. Okay. Now, uh, and just as you're doing in homework number seven, you can derive this equation motion. This is the simplified version of homework number seven result for the case where there's no torsion. Right? So you're going to see where that comes from. Then I'm going to think H and again assume it's some function of time times some function of Y. And again, I'll use this simple function of Y because it makes the algorithm simpler. And it's not too bad. I mean, this is going to be a terrible thing. Okay. And then I can do one of two things. I can use convergence method, or I can use your freely rich. Now, I, I think last time I told you something that was not true. I know you will find this difficult to believe, but I would tell you something that 
to. But I didn't do it to listen. I had two times thought about it. No. I think you will get a different answer depending on whether you use Philippians method or Bailey Ritt. It won't be wildly different, but it will be different. Even for one shape. Even for one shape. I was thinking that for one shape it wouldn't make a difference, but now that I thought about it, I'm fairly certain it will make a difference. But you don't want to take my word for it, do you? The answer is no, of course not. You want to do something. So homework number eight, we get to homework number eight, will be to ask you to derive the equation once using really rich and once using glycogen. And you can tell me whether it's the same or not. I think it's going to be a little different. But for the moment, for the moment we're going to use glycogen just to be, have variety, right? So what do I mean by glycogen's method? Glycogen's method means I take this equation for H. Put it in there, well, I guess I should give you some numbers. One, two, three, four, five. They got, yeah. You, you, you don't have these notes with these equation numbers. Oh, sorry about that. Well, we can reissue these notes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and so I'll call this equation five, six. And now if we use a version of this, I'll get seven. What is, what is work is that we're going to measure, I take six and I put it in five and replace H by this expression. Then I multiply through by this function of Y and integrate from zero to L. That's work is that. Note that nowhere in that, as I just described, do I account for the boundary conditions. Okay. And that's why I think really rich will give you something a little different because implicit in, in really rich is an attempt, however feeble or strong, an attempt to account for the boundary condition, even for one mode. And I think that's why why they don't give you quite the same. But they will give you equations that look a lot like this. It won't be exactly this. They'll be close. Probably close enough for formula design principles, but not for the final all-up analysis uh, when you're about to make a flight test. Okay, if you use the curve method, then you're going to get equation 7, and then you have all these definitions. Uh, these are definitions, right? You can't argue for the definitions. Well, you can, but usually not worthwhile. So, M is the mass per unit span integrated over the span multiplied by the boat shape squared, right? And K is this factor multiplied by the boat shape. That comes out of the Gorka method, right? Uh, the boat shapes themselves, uh, I'm going to normalize them. So that this is this is true. Well, now that I think about it, ah, C. Let's see. C is a, is a numerical factor I need to make this statement true, right? It's a motion, so I can normalize it by any. Uh, thing I like. In fact, we'll calculate in real time. Why not? We can do that. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to normalize so that this is true, which means I, and this is really, this mode shape is really going to be this times two. And then this is a, a, a weighted gust velocity. It's the gust velocity times the mode shape dy normalized by L. And then I, using these definitions, my equation becomes this. So let's, let's uh, take a moment. It's good that you know about normalization. Let's take a moment and, and see what C is. What did I say? I said C sub H is equal to C times Y upon L squared. But I want the interval of C sub H squared in Y to be just L. All right? And therefore, so this tells me what C is. So let's see if we can do that. And so we have uh, c squared, y over l squared, but then it's squared again, so the fourth equals l, dy, from 0 to l. I think I can almost do this. Right. So this is going to be y to the fifth over 5, c squared over l to the fourth, uh, Evaluated from yeah, from, yeah, 
from zero to L, and I want that to be equal to L. Uh, so that's equal to L to the fifth over phi c squared over L to the fourth equal L. So c squared is equal to phi. Is that right? Yeah. C. Really? I mean, I can normalize it any way I want, right? Another way to normalize it, which is why I did when c was set equal to 1, if I normalize it as c set equal to 1, then I'm normalizing so that the tip mode reflection is 1. Right? That would be the other conventional way to normalize. You can normalize any way you like, mathematically. But normally people, I'm intended, normally people would either normalize this way or normalize so that the tip. So if I'm going to do what I said in the notes, I better do this. So this is, uh, well, you you can remember that, right? You don't need to remember. Okay. Well, I'll give you that, too. No extra charge. Let's call that page, page two. Uh, okay. So now I'm going back to the notes from 2.5. I've, I've, I've got this equation. This equation I'm really going to use, right? This is this is the equation for the molar amplitude, H hat. Due to a cut in both. Okay. All right. Now, to do test analysis, I'm, I just want to start out mathematically like Flutter analysis, but a little different. In fact, quite different physically, even though the mathematics is not too different. I'm going to now assume that the gust is a sinusoidal gust in time. And I'm going to use the exponential notation because it's going to ease my algebraic manipulation. Physically, I'm thinking of the gust as being the real part of this. And then when I compute each hat, it would be a complex number. But the physical part is really just the real part of that. And that I can do the same thing, by the way, with the imaginary parts. It's just a matter of being consistent. I either use consistently real part for input and output or imaginary part for input and output. But the convention is in the, in the literature to use the real part. Right? Okay. Then if I put this form, this is uh, if, if, uh, this is equation 10. If I put, uh, place 10 in 9, 9 was that equation of motion, I can get the ratio of the out output to the input, right? And I, I've normalized these again because I like I like it. So this is the transfer function between the input gust and the output. And strictly speaking, what I have found is the sinusoidal response due to a sinusoidal input. But if I believe in Fourier transforms, which I do, and you should too, there are no known exceptions to the validity of Fourier transforms. Then I can compute the answers for having determined it initially for sinusoidal inputs and sinusoidal outputs, I can determine the answer for any old input and any old output. And that's the wonderful thing about Fourier transforms. Uh, but before I do that, I want to manipulate this a little bit. Uh, first of all, I want to know what what is the value of the transfer function when I'm in resonance, because resonance is really the whole story for Gus. And the Gus is giving rise to a resonant response of the system. Right? And therefore, it would be interesting to know what the transfer function is right at resonance, namely when the inertia term and the surface term balance. It turns out to be something that looks like a reduced frequency, or one over reduced frequency. Right? And typically, again, that number is going to be a word of one when you non-dimensionalize everything. Okay. More generally, the transfer function looks like this. And I've written this in a certain form, which proves to be very helpful. I've written this like it's a spring mass damper oscillator, because here's the spring term, here's the inertia of a mass term, and this is the damping term. And traditionally, you write spring mass damper oscillators in this form, where I can identify what the non-dimensional damping coefficient is. And uh, you do that by equating this term to this form, and that deduces the effective damping. So this non-dimensional damping factor is one quarter 
times of view, which turns out to be a ratio of fluid mass, structural mass, times of physical earthquake slope, because that gives me a measure of how much aerodynamic force I have for a given motion. And then there's another reduced frequency. <laughs> Except now this is reduced frequency with the resonant frequency of the system in the okay. right. So I have all that. So here's my new form of uh, you know, the transfer function and uh, all of these things I'll denote by equation 12. And then I can write this again. This is just saying the output equals the input times the transfer function. And then if I do an inverse Fourier transform, I get H as a function of time for any old plus time history. Where I is the inverse Fourier transform of the transform. I'm going to pause here. That was a time to ask question. That was a good time to ask question. It looks fun. Stockholm, would you like to ask a question? I have a question, but uh, the, the image arrives like five, ten seconds after the voice. So it's hard to follow sometimes. Oh, he's having a hard time reading it? No, they have told us the audio. Oh, the audio. I'm afraid there's nothing we can do about that today. We're working on getting more new hardware. I will try to speak more slowly and more distinctly. Is that helpful? No, it's not about the, the voice. We can hear it perfectly, but uh, like it comes way before the image, so it's not the same what you're writing and what we are listening. I mean, there are some delays. I'm sorry? There are some delays. Oh, delays. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, so... Oh, time. Yeah. Yeah. So, what we hear you right now is uh, several seconds. Uh, of. This one. I thought you were in 10 seconds later. Oh, <laughs> 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 that is that is unfortunate. <laughs> I I feel your pain and I'm very empathetic. But I, I'm sorry about that. I really am sorry about that. But yeah. Look at that there. Fine. Uh, okay. Well. Nevertheless, pressing on. Uh, the uh, the uh, inverse. Transform of the transfer function is this wonderful thing called I, not to be confused with the moment of inertia, not to be confused with the I independent system. This is the impulse I. Okay? I knew you knew that. But if you want to be absolutely certain, you can put an H W G subscript on it to remind you that this is the relationship between the input of the gust velocity and the output, in this case, the bending. Reflection. Right? All right, and it, I thought I assigned. I normally assign this as Ohm function, but I, I wrote it down. There. But if, again, if you don't want to take my word for it, you can try to evaluate this. How would you evaluate this interval? By the way, if someone gave you the transfer function, they said compute that interval. How would you do that? I'm not sure how that would do it for you. Not, I don't think they give you an analytic form unless you use symbolic algebra. You might, you, there might be some symbolic algebra in that lab that will allow you to do this. So you do that. Okay. Well, that's the other part. Uh, the same thing, same thing. But if you had to do it yourself without the benefit of Mathematica or MATLAB, how would you do it? Uh, uh, I don't think <laughs> that, would a, that would be a, that would be a, I think Dr. Passy and an expert. Dr. Hall would be a good person. So if you ask Dr. Hall to do it, what would he, how would he do it? Uh, not for free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's a good guy. He'd probably do it for free. Uh, More likely, he would tell you how to do it. He would tell you. <laughs> so how, what, what did he tell you to do? <laughs> do <it> yourself. <laughs> do yourself. So do yourself. You have to really do it yourself. What, what, what are your, there are several options. Yeah, there are, there are, yeah, you can find a book on Fourier transforms, and this one's probably in there. Absolutely. Um, but how, how did the person who wrote the book Fourier transforms? Well, 
Well, let me tell you one way you could do it, but I wouldn't say, oh, you could do it this way, but you could do it numerically, right? It's just a numerical interval. You know age, so you go to alpha, you select the time, you integrate over omega. Um, you could, uh, but actually, if you, you can do this mathematically, but you had to have taken a certain course in mathematics. And what kind of a course in mathematics would you have had to take? What kind? Complex variables. Yeah, you know how to you know how to look at complex functions and look at their poles and do contour integration. How many people are taking a course in complex variables? Not many. They don't do that anymore. Okay. Well, back in the day when some of us were school, you took, and there's still some very nice books. You can you can do this analytically. You have to understand the theory of complex. Okay, um, but anyway, however you do it, this is the answer, I think. And, and so let's look at the answer. This is 16. First of all, there's a constant sum, right? There's Q. This input function is proportional to Q, right? Uh, there's L. There's DC, L, D, alpha. This is the mass. Remember, this is the mass. This is the natural frequency. This is 1 minus the the uh, non-dimensional damping factor squared. This number typically is small compared to one. In fact, this form assumes it's much smaller than one. Because if it were larger than one, this would be a complex number itself. All right, even though H, the transfer function, is a complex number, right? I is a real number, as it must be, because the request is real and the response is real, right? So the fact that the transfer function is complex is interesting, and represents the magnitude and phase shift between the input and the output. But ultimately, it's the impulse function, which deals in the time domain. It must be a real, real thing. Yeah? So, however you do it, when you compute the impulse, if you did numerically, you would get both the real part and the magnetic part for I. But I hope the magnetic part would be really tiny <laughs> compared to the real part. Otherwise, you, again, you know, you're just not quite right. Now, you can simplify this slightly if the damping ratio is small, and this, and, and so let's look at this because it's easily, more easily physically interpreted. This is a sinusoidal function of time. It's, it's resonating, if you will, at the natural frequency of the system. And it's decaying with time because this is a damp, stable system, unless I've exceeded the quarter velocity. But since I've only looked at the bending motion, by leaving out the torsion motion, I've eliminated the possibility of flutter. Now, the flutter and press can have to talk to each other, right? Because there's no point doing a press analysis beyond the flutter speed, beyond the flutter speed. So the first thing you want to know is where the flutter key is. And then, once you know the flutter key is in, you turn me out press response up to that condition. I mean, said that. Physically, it doesn't come out of this model because I've limited the possibility of flutter. If I if I were looking at the gust response, some of this calculated gust response, you have a code and again, a phone or Airbus, and it's giving you the gust response. And it's pi and versus Q. You think the gust response is going to go up or down as Q and P? It's going to go up or down? How big is it going to be according to linear model? How big is it going to be when I reach the quarter condition? How big? Yeah. So you can do a flutter analysis if you include enough modes to include the possibility of plotting by doing a cusp response analysis and plotting how does the cusp response vary the Q and you'll see it getting bigger and when it gets to the quarter condition, it gets really big. Uh, well, sometimes what you do is you plot one over the response because then you can extrapolate the zero, right? Because the response is going to send one over the response and the zero. So you calculate uh, the gust response of several times the Q, and then you extrapolate to the Now, if I'm doing a flight test and I'm looking at gust response, which I might be, I can plot the major gust response as a function of Q. And I can also plot one over the response and extrapolate to zero and make it a flutter test at the same time. Uh, the other problem with that is usually nature doesn't cooperate. That is, 
you have to have a certain kind of, of trust input <laughs> to get good measured data. So you have to you have to wait until the until, until the weather conditions are right to fly around and do a night gust response. And you probably really don't want to do that for flutter. For flutter you want to get some answers right away but that's a, a showstopper that flutter, right? So normally people do flutter testing on a clear day with not much gust input and they have other ways of exciting the system so they can look at a substantial response to the site limits like a flutter or not as they increase. But some people still say, I, when I'm doing uh, flight flutter tests, uh, some people, it depends on the aircraft in the company, they will rely on on, on the gusts to excite the system rather than having their own separate way of exciting the system. Because I have come up with a simple way that the time and money is right, and that has its own challenges. So if you're doing a flight test mm -hmm. and you're trying to test the flutter bound. Yeah. You're going to have like some red line. Like, you know, yeah. Is this red line going to be based off like a response frequency? Like, you can't, or like some sort of damping you can detect Normally, when you're trying to determine whether you're approaching the flutter condition, you're either looking at damping, and you remember there's multiple, multiple modes. Mm -hmm. So, part of the challenge with both the flutter testing is to track damping is knowing which mode, which, which mode and the stamping are really likely to be crucial. And it may not be obvious to you, right? There may, you probably have done some computational modeling. And so the computational model says there's going to be mode three and four that look most critical. And so that, that's a guideline when you start doing the measurement. But of course, you're relying on the fact that the computation is kind of right. And you always want to be prepared for the fact that it may have gotten wrong. Yep. Yep. So, tracking damping, is one way, and if you're looking for damping, initially what happens is the damping in the system goes up, as Q goes up, but then there's a peak. And typically it starts coming down. And when it starts coming down, you know you might be headed to a point. So that's one way. The other way is to look at the level of response, and then plot one over the response versus Q and see when that is extrapolated to the table. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And you can catch you can find damping real time. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of software out there now that will take measured data and, and try to, uh, from that, extract frequencies and that. Yeah. That's a business where people will be happy to sell you some software. And do these flight tests on the air or on the ground? I'm and sorry? They do these flight testing by flying the plane or on the ground? Well, when we do on the ground, we call it wind belt testing, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's a major decision. Uh, some people will go directly from computation to flight tests without wind tunnel testing, because wind tunnel testing is time and money also. Uh, or some people will say, no, I always want to do a wind tunnel test. Uh, the danger of the wind tunnel test is the wind tunnel model is not the real airplane. It's scale, right? And not all the features of the real airplane are in that wind tunnel model. And so it's totally not unknown that you do a computation. You do a wind pump test, you get the flight test, you get three different answers. So, usually you get answers that can be correlated, at least after the fact. I mean, one of the reasons you do wind pump tests is, okay, now I can compare the computations of the wind pump model, and they don't agree. And then I start thinking, well, why don't they agree? And I say, oh, yes, I left out that mode. Or, uh, this is really more of a plane like structure than a beam structure, so I should have used a plane structural model than a beam model. Or, I use the incompressible flow aerodynamic theory, and this, I'm, my wind zone test is at my point 0.7. By the time I get to point 0.7, I really need to count the compressibility. So once, once you compare the two, then you start thinking about why they don't agree as well as they might. Um, uh, but uh, the uh, the windfall test is, is, is a check on the computational model. Right? And then sometimes they will then adjust the computation model we agree the wind tunnel test. And depending on how 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 much margin they have, uh, my order mock number computed is 0.9. Okay. I plan to fly this airplane up to 0.85. I, I, I wouldn't rely on a wind tunnel test <laughs> plus the computation model. It's absolutely sure it wouldn't flutter it. Uh, at point in five, right? Just because my computation says it won't flutter until I get to point five. When you're in that mock number range, 
the uncertainties are very great in everything. Um, experiment, computation, whatever. So, again, someone has to make a judgment. Someone has to make a judgment. And those are hard flaws in the country. How much? There's some money. And, and the consequences of being wrong are, well, yeah. I mean, you, you're always trading off saving some substantial sums now by skipping the windfall test or whatever versus the fact that if you get it wrong and you have to change the airplane once it's built, you got to fix it. Does that help? Okay. Okay. Now, so this is, yeah, this is what, uh, what we have here. Uh, one final thing. If I have the impulse function, if I believe in Fourier transforms, I can, I can, Compute the transfer of the impulse function and get back to the transfer function. Okay? And you can compute uh, the impulse function or measure it. Uh, and let me show you how to do that. Remember what we have here. I'll write down the equation one time and I'll write it in my chart. So I'm now on page three of my current notes for the present day. Um, and let's see, let me find the right possibility. The input output relationship in time is the interval from, uh, well, I'll go from minus infinity. For I of T minus tau, the gust input velocity of function tau, U, E tau. So let's, uh, <laughs> and, uh, I'm using equation number, so let's start with, with, again with equation one. Uh, and I wrote down I a moment ago. I said I of T is equal to something. Right? I'm not going to write it again. It's that exponential form. Well, that's true for t greater than zero, but it's zero for t less than zero. Okay. When I do, when I did my contour integration using complex variable theory, all right, or I looked it up in the transform table, this is what it told me. And so, what does that mean? Well, when t is greater than tau, well, when when tau equals t. It becomes zero, right? And so when, when tau is greater than t, then t minus tau is less than zero. Therefore, the circle limit is only t. It's not infinity, right? Because of this. Conversely, if I'm doing a time history, I'm, I'm usually thinking of the time not beginning long, long ago. It started in some instant of time, which I'll call zero. I'll start by clock. I said t is zero. Or tau equals zero. So a lower limit is actually just zero. Right. And, and sometimes this is called causality. It says, basically says that the gust at times later than the present time can influence the response of the present time. Right? Which you, most people believe. Okay. okay. But now, how, how, if, if I were allowed to do a computer simulation of some sort, or of physical measurement in flight or in the wind tunnel, and I could choose any kind of gust I want. If I choose a very special kind of gust, I can I can determine I. Okay. So now I'm thinking of the box. I have a computer simulation which is a black box. Okay. I don't I have no idea what's in there. Someone produced it, and they tell me if you give them a time history of a gust, they'll produce the response. Okay, that's right. Or someone says, I'm going to go out and in the wind tunnel or in practice, and I can put in any kind of gust you want. And, and if you allow me to do that, I'll tell you what I is, because I might then want to know the response for other kinds of gusts other than the special gust. The special gust that allows you to determine I is an impulse function. That's why this is, <laughs> this is called an impulse response. So if I said W of G of tau, over u equal 
to delta of tau, where this is a delta function. This is not a variation. Right? Never been confused with a variation. This is a delta function. And what does a delta function look like? A delta function looks like the following. Here's tau. Delta function is like this. This time interval is epsilon. Epsilon is going to be a really small number. This, well, the, the magnitude of the delta function is going to be 1 over epsilon. Therefore, the interval under this time curve is 1 over epsilon times epsilon, otherwise known as 1. And then I'm taking the limit as epsilon goes to infinity. What that does to the integral is if w over g over u is equal to a delta function, then h at t over c is equal to i evaluated by tau is equal to zero. So the impulse function is the response for this special input. And people actually use this in physical experiments. They can't quite get a delta function, but you can get pretty close, right? You can, you can have something which, which gives you an input over a small interval of time of a certain magnitude. And since it's a linear, theory, the linear system, I can scale everything. It doesn't really matter what the amplitude is. I can scale things, right? If, if the impulse turns out to be 6, and I want a unit impulse, I divide by 6. Or it turns out to be 1 fifth, I multiply by 5. So, this has some real physical significance. It's something that can be measured. Okay? And so it might be, so you can measure a transfer function. You can put sinusoidal inputs in and measure sinusoidal outputs. You get a transfer function. So you can also measure an impulse function. And then if you're leaving word transfer, you can measure both. They, there should be a correspondence, right? Where you transfer to the two out Okay. Okay. Well, you know, I can't have so much time. I didn't, I'm not going to cover the day why I think it's over, but come back on Tuesday. The next thing we're going to do is random inputs and random outputs. I really don't need to do anything more. If I'm willing to evaluate this integral numerically, I don't need to do anything more for a random input. I just put in a random, I have a random number generator, and I use that to model the gus, and I do this integral, and there's a response. But it turns out there's a theory in the frequency domain, which is usually thought to be more useful, more insightful, more computationally efficient. <laughs> there are a lot of advantages of doing the random input output analysis in the frequency domain. This is usually called power spectral density analysis. So we're going to do a little power spectral density analysis. I should be charging more. We're taking a lot of material this What is that? You always say, like, how do they create charge? How do they create charge? Like, what do you charge for? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I should double one. Charge. What am I charging? I think I'm charging numbers. Well, because the school charges them to be in the room. Oh, that's true. You don't charge anything extra. I, that's right. That's true. You, well, the some of these people think, well, I'm not going to Some people, some people are going to be by these I won't miss any things. <laughs> Okay. All right. We'll see you on Tuesday. They have, they have already found.